Father, we thank you for allowing us once again to approach your throne of grace. We ask, dear Heavenly Father, that as we come to you, begging, Father, that you just keep us single-minded, Father, as we come together and worship you. We pray, Father, that all we do is in acceptance of your way and your will. We thank you, Father, for arising us out of our beds and allowing us just this time of worship. In Jesus' name the Spirit's name, we pray. Amen.
shall we pray? Eternal God, our Father, the creator of all mankind, we come to you this morning, Father, with our head bowed and our heart humble, giving praise and thanks to you for allowing us to see another day. We thank you, Father, once again for allowing us to come out once again to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Father, we ask for forgiveness of any sins that we committed and forgive us of our shortcomings as well. Ask you, dear Father, to bless Brother Mayberry as he comes forward to deliver thy word. Be with him and the things that he stood on his mind. May he do so in a way that be pleasing and acceptable unto thee. Father, we are, merc we are thankful and merciful of those that are sick and shut in uh, here at the Northside Congregation. We ask that you continue to be with them and watch over them and strengthen them in the area which is needed. Again, Father, you know their need better than anyone else does. So grant them and bless them according to their needs. And Father, as we go into the further this service, we ask that you guide our, guide our minds and hearts that all things that we see and do be pleasing and acceptable unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Let us adore the Lord in the praise unto Him. church say amen and let the church say amen again certainly it is a blessing and a privilege from the almighty God of heaven that again we find ourselves on this side of the timeline of life for whatever the reason he chose to do it God woke us up this morning he blessed us with another day 
He blessed us with uh, health and strength and right minds therein. And if you ever want evidence of the fact that you are blessed, just consider for at least this moment that you are among the land of the living and you are being seen and not being viewed. To those who are worshiping with us and visiting with us in this digital worship space this morning, we want to extend to you a warm welcome. We're so glad that you've chosen to be with us here at the Northside Church of Christ uh, for our worship experience today. And it's our prayer that you being with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying and that you will want to come back and be with us because you have benefited by being here today. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities at the Church of Christ at Northside. And wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you possibly can. Uh, as promised uh, a few weeks ago, we have been checking uh, the infection numbers for uh, COVID in the area, and there has been marked improvement uh, in the infection rate, uh, it's gone down quite a bit from uh, when we had to make our closing announcement a few weeks ago. So considering that and uh, praying that those numbers stay on that trend, uh, beginning next week, uh, which is February the 6th, Sunday, February the 6th, uh, we will uh, resume uh, in-person worship experience here at Northside. Uh, more information will be coming out um, uh, by various means through this week, but just be prepared on next Sunday. We will be uh, in person fully um, again. I'm going to ask that you will turn into your Bibles uh, to the fifth chapter of the gospel account is recorded by Mark. Mark, the fifth chapter. And I ask that you will meet me at verse 17. Mark, chapter 5 beginning at verse 17 and reading through verse 20, we find these words. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coast. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did marvel. In the second stanza of Charles Wesley's hymn, A Charge to Keep, I Have, he writes this. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. To serve the present age, my calling to fulfill. I want to submit to us this morning that the calling of Christians and the church as a whole is to serve the present age. I think that's important to note because too many times we find ourselves looking back in nostalgia to yesterday 
And there's no need to look back in nostalgia because that age is gone. There's a number of others of us who are looking forward in expectancy to tomorrow. And while looking ahead is a good thing, our, our preoccupation should not be looking forward because that age has not even arrived yet. Your calling is to serve the present age. And Wesley saw the awesomeness of that task and he added in his hymn, Oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. And I believe one reason why Wesley pleaded that all his powers would be engaged to do the master's will was because he recognized that there was a boogeyman factor involved in the equation. See, one of the things Wesley recognized was that we all have phobias. We all have fears. We all have apprehensions. We all have something or someone of whom we are afraid. And if we don't deal with that fear, we will be hindered from fulfilling our calling. I submit to all of us this morning that we all have a boogeyman. All of us have something that spooks us. All of us have something that causes the nappy hair on our heads to stand up and straighten up and our bad feet to run. I suggest again that all of us have a boogeyman. For the most part, all of us at some point will have to face some fear or, or some phobia we all have something that will stupefy us into a terrified, panic-stricken state. Something in life will almost scare us to death. It might be just a visit to the doctor's office and having some tests run. And the time you wait for the results to come back and scare you to death especially when they're looking for something that's terminal. It, it might be the shutdown of corporations and the downsizing and your job is at stake. And you got the house note and the car notes and the kids in college and you need the job badly. And that scares you to death. I, I remember when my sons were small that they were afraid of the dark. And at one time, something had spooked them that caused them to want to sleep with the light on. They had seen or they had heard something outside the window at night which had given them a fear of the dark. And even though sometimes I would sit in the room or stand outside the door till they had fallen asleep, and they tried to show them that there was nothing to be frightened of. Their fears were still not dispelled. I said that to say this. Some of us are just like that. Some of us are dealing with a boogeyman outside the window of our minds. He spooks us. And you might as well own up to the fact that you're scared of something. Now, I, I already know what some of you are saying. Some of you are saying, well, but God has not given us the spirit of fear. And you'd be correct. But as long as you live in the flesh, it is also true that you are subject to fear to subject to some phobia, subject to some boogeyman. And the reason why I say that all of us have a boogeyman 
is because of what's contained here in our text. When we look at the context, we, we find that there was a man who was dealing with some serious issues. He was demonized. He was battling with some 6,000 demons at one time. And more often than not, he would lose the fight and, and come under control of this legion of boogeymen. They frightened him. They, they terrified him to the point in which he developed suicidal and homicidal tendencies. John Mark records in verse 5 that night and day he experienced bouts of depression in which he spent time crying and even cutting himself with stones. He had been spooked into trying to commit suicide. And then so, in order to keep him from doing harm to others, we find that the people of the town had chained him. Let me add this here real quick, parenthetically, that if the church isn't careful, it will result to car carnal and worldly means trying to deal with spiritual problems. They took a man who was possessed by demons and thought that some chains was going to do him some good. So I want you to know this morning that the charge uh, 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 of the church is to use spiritual means in dealing with our boogeyman. But note this. This man's demonic possession got to the point where it caused him to act as the boogeyman. Let me make sure you understand what's, what's happening there. This man's boogeyman got to the point where they had him acting as the boogeyman to others. And if we're not careful, our boogeyman will have us acting as the boogeyman when it comes to someone else. You see in the text, the Bible lets us know when passerbys would come, he would rush out of that graveyard and scare them. Uh, he, he, he reminds me a little bit of certain folk who are themselves dealing with some serious issues. And as a result, they are compelled to act as boogeymen around other folk. You, if you're honest with yourself, you, you, you've got boogeymen on your job. You've got boogeymen at your school. You've got boogeymen in your neighborhood. There are even boogeymen in the church who scare folk into doing what they want done. They, they spook folk into yielding to their foolishness. Everybody has some boogeymen around them. And it seems like folk are afraid to face them and to withstand them and because of that, they go on and on, scaring folk. But a strange thing happened one day in the life of this man. You see, the boogeyman got spooked. But Jesus one day came to his turf. And out of habit... This man who was possessed rushed out to spook them. But before the demons could restrain the man, I want you to get what I'm saying here right now. Before the demons could restrain the man, he had charged Jesus. Mark says in verse 2 that when Jesus was come out of the ship, immediately they met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, 
I contend this morning that it was not the demon's idea for this man to charge at Jesus. You see, even the boogeyman has a boogeyman. And to the demons, Jesus was the boogeyman. And I suggest to us that in verse 6, it was the man's own idea to rush Jesus when he saw him afar off and not the demons. You see, the demons knew who Jesus was. And I also suggest to you this morning that it was the demon's idea and not the man's idea to worship Jesus because they knew who Jesus was. And so, I want to suggest to you this morning that if you're going to fulfill your calling when you're dealing with your boogeyman, that you must be aware of God's provided power. You must be aware of God's provided power. When it looks like your boogeyman is, is, is going to rush to, 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 to tear you apart, you've got to realize that it's because of God's provided power that the boogeyman will stumble and fall. And he will fall down and recognize and worship the Lord. You've got to recognize the fact that the Lord is your refuge and your strength and a very present help in times of trouble. He's not going to allow the boogeyman to get you as you fulfill your calling. He will call out to the boogeyman. And you have to realize that he's able to take care of you. God can always Make a move. He's never so boxed in where he can't move. Now, 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 for those of you who, who know the game of checkers, you know that if you're a, a good player, you can box in your opponent where they cannot make a move. But we need to understand this morning that God is not boxed in by circumstances or situations or people, or even demonic power. He can always make a move. He will call out the boogeyman. And when you know the Lord is on your side, you're dealing with a God who can always make a move, and when he moves, no man or power can hinder him. In this case, the demons had to flee. But not only will the Lord call the boogeyman out, he will also restore you through his provided power to a right relationship. We find in verse 15 of our context that this man was found sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. So the first thing this text suggests is this. That if we're going to carry out our charge, we have to be aware of God's provided power. But then secondly, if we're going to fulfill our charge, we have to be aware of God's protective presence. We have to be aware of God's protective presence. And that's significant. Because when we look at the context it looks like Jesus is now getting ready to abandon this man. Look at, the, look at the text. Verse 18 tells us that this man's only request is that he might be with Jesus. But the response of Jesus in verse 19 seems a bit odd and peculiar. Jesus tells him in verse 19 to go home to your friends. But before you reach a preconceived misconception of what is actually happening here, 
Let's do a quick grammatical analysis of the text. See, in verse 18, when the man, we find the man who had been possessed with the devil prayed him. That verb from the, the original language, uh, parakale, is the imperfect of repeated action, which simply means this. The man kept on asking Jesus to allow him to be with him. The man repeatedly over and over and over again is asking Jesus, can I stay with you? But the enlightenment comes when we look at the verb translated go home. In verse 19, and it's a present imperative. Now, let me tell you what this means. It means that an action is already in progress at the time. Here's the significance. At the same time this man is asking Jesus over and over again to stay with him, he was already in the process or the progress of going in the direction of home. Seems to me as if he already knew the answer to his prayer. It's as if he already knew that he was going in the protective presence of the Lord. He realized that he had already been delivered from those boogeymen. He had sat down in the presence of Jesus and had been taught. He was no longer naked, but he was clothed in the righteousness of Christ. He was in his right mind. He had gained some self-control through the provided power of God. And so now it's as if he says, as he's going in the direction of home, I'm not afraid of the boogeyman no more. And the reason he makes that move from fear to confidence is because he's assured of God's protective presence. If the Lord tells us to keep going in the direction that we're headed in, we can be assured that he will be with us. And I want to suggest to somebody this morning that the one place in which we need God's protective presence is when we're going home and get home. For oftentimes, our family becomes our foe and our friends act like enemies. Look at the scripture record. It was Esau's brother who tricked him out of his blessing. It was Jacob's brother who had plotted to kill him. It was David's son who plotted to overthrow his father from the throne. It was Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery. It was Moses' kinfolk who complained and rebelled against him in the wilderness. It was the mother and brother of Jesus himself who decided he was beside himself with madness and decided to come take him home. It was Jesus' familiar friend Judas who betrayed him with a kiss. Even Jesus came unto his own people and they rejected him. Prophet Micah said it like this. Trust ye not in a friend. Put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonors the father. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, Micah concludes this. I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. Jesus himself made this pronouncement. 
Suppose ye that I have come to give peace on earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two, two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I tell you again, we need the protective presence of God in our familiar surroundings at home. Oftentimes, it's our family, it's our friends, it's even our fellow church members who do the most harm and cause the greatest damage. And we have to be aware of God's protective presence if our, in our calling if we're going to fulfill it. He offers us a place of dwelling under the shadow of his wings. He promises protective covering. In the time of trouble, he provides a hiding place in his pavilion and a secret place in his tabernacle. But thirdly, if we're going to carry out our charge, we also have to recall God's past performance. We have to recall God's past performance. Obviously, this man gets to a place where he f feels that God can handle anything he dealt with in the present because he, he dealt with what this man had faced in the past. The Lord had exercised his demons. He had spooked this man's boogeyman. He had given him back his right mind. He had clothed his, don't, uh, his nakedness. He had domesticated his manners and has given him a new nature. And since the Lord had did all of that for him in the past, he certainly could handle what this man might face in the present. So in verse number 20, we find this man sets out and begins to publish, to proclaim as a herald the great things Jesus has done for him in the past. And if you're going to carry out your charge, you must be aware of God's performance in the past. I think I need to tell somebody that God oftentimes runs interference for us even when we don't realize that's what he's doing you football fans know what i'm talking about sometimes you'll see on, on the football field the running back as he's making cuts and he's speeding toward the end zone see, see you know he didn't get there solely because he was a good running back the fact of the matter is this if he's on a team that's operating as it should, there are some other guys out there throwing blocks and opening holes for him to run through. That's what God does for us. He throws blocks for us. He blocks the progress of the boogeyman. He blocks and he stops the mouths of our enemies. He runs interference for us. He opens holes for us. He makes ways for us. And when we're in a tight spot, we need to remember what he's done in the past. You see, we've got to learn to focus on the incredible events in our past, which only God can handle. See, there are some things in life you can handle yourself. And there are some things you can only handle with help from some other folk. But there are some things in life that only God can handle. 
And I feel sorry for the person who has never been brought into a situation where they know beyond the shadow of a doubt that only God can save them. Because you can't have real faith in God until you absolutely know what God can do. In fact, you can't even have a testimony until you have a test. You might make a talk, but it ain't a testimony. A testimony comes from a test. In fact, you've got to spell test, T-E-S-T, -E before you get to the emony part. You've got to go through something before you can talk about it. Remember what he did for you on yesterday. Remember what he did for you last year. Recall how he got you out of some mess that you was in and you had no way to get out of it yourself. And I feel sorry for the person who has not had an experience where they've learned that only God can raise them up when they know it wasn't the financial institution, when they know it wasn't the medical doctor, when they know it was not somebody pulling the right strings, when they know it wasn't their bank account or their education or their knowledge or even their good looks, when they know it was God who brought them out. Because when you go through an experience like that, you can base your present faith on his past performance. No doubt that this man who was now delivered knew no fear of the boogeyman again. No doubt he had no fear of demons or desertion or depression or even death again. And it wasn't because he wasn't afraid, but it was because of his bold faith in Christ Jesus. Because after Jesus delivered him from possession, he had no fear of it because he knew that Jesus could deal with any demon from hell. And if you're going to carry out your charge, you have to recall God's past performance. I believe that's what Newton had in mind when he wrote, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Grace brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on. What he's really saying is this. What God has already done for me is a testimony of what he can do for me. So we need to stop getting so caught up looking at the past and at the future that we don't remember what God has done in his past performance. Matter of fact, before we ask God for anything in prayer, we ought to thank him and praise him for what he's already done. Before I ask him for my bread tomorrow, I need to thank him for my bread on today and yesterday. But fourth and finally, if you're going to carry out your charge to the present age, then you have to rely on God's future provision. You have to rely on God's future provision. I suggest to you this morning that God wants the masses to marvel at his marvelous mercy. Let me say that again. I suggest to us this morning that God wants the masses to marvel at his marvelous mercy. For as a result of the man's testimony, Mark says in verse number 20, that all men did marvel. See, in your future, the Lord has made provisions for the masses to marvel. God's mercy is adapted to meet our misery. And it's his mercy that relieves our misery. 
And when misery has been relieved, men marvel. God has made future provision for abundant mercy. You see, when you minister to the misery of the drug addict, the masses will marvel. When you minister to the misery of the emotionally wounded, the masses will marvel. When you minister to the misery of the miserable, the masses will marvel. When you minister to the misery of the abused, the masses will marvel. And perhaps that's what David had in mind when he wrote, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What he's speaking of there is God's future provision. Perhaps the prophet Jeremiah was alluding to the same thing when he wrote, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Because when we remember what God has done for us in the past, we can have faith that he will do for us in the future. If God has done it once, he can do it again and again and again, and again. So I challenge somebody this morning, be aware of God's provided power. Take note of God's protective presence. Recall God's past performance and have confidence in God's future provision and you will be able to fulfill the calling that God has placed on you. No matter how many boogeymen that you have to face, have faced, or will face in life, God is the boogeyman to your boogeyman. And somebody just needs to recognize right now, somebody just needs to come in the awareness that whatever your boogeyman is, God can handle your boogeyman if you would just put it, if you would just put them into God's hands, God will deal with them. God can deal with them. And he will give you the power after he deals with them to go ahead and fulfill your charge, your call. If you're not a child of God this morning, you need to understand that the call, the charge of Jesus, he fulfilled it. You might ask, what was that call? What was that charge? Paul capsulizes it this way in Romans 5 eight, For God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ came to die as a propitiation, as a sacrifice in replacement for your sins. The prophet Ezekiel said long before the coming of Christ into this physical world that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. In essence, you and I were under a death sentence. But Christ came to die for us in place of us so that we might live. And I tell you this morning, if somebody was willing to die for me, it would be a slap in their face if I was not willing to live for them. Well, well, well Brother Preacher, how do I live for him? I, I'm so glad you asked that question. You've already just heard how he came and how he died for your sins. It doesn't stop there though. Because after he died for your sins on that cross on Calvary, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He laid in that tomb Friday night. He laid in that tomb all Saturday. But somewhere sometime on Sunday morning, 
He arose from that tomb alive and with all power in his hands. And even right now, he's still alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Step one is this. Believe what you just heard. Step two, repent of all of your sins. That just simply means that you turn away from them. Step three, confess that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the Son of God. And step four, be baptized for the remission of all of your sins. And living faithful to your death, one day heaven and all of its glories will be yours for all eternity. You'll be with the God who saved you. And if that's your desire this morning, we invite you to make it known right now. If you would just reach out to us using the contact information that's on your screen, whether it's the phone number, whether it's the email address, we'll reach right back out to you and facilitate whatever your need is. If you need prayer this morning, we'll pray with and we'll pray for you. If you need restoration, we'll aid you on your restoration journey. If you need to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, we will make that happen this morning. If you just reach out to us, we'll reach out to you and facilitate whatever your need is. And at this time, we're going to turn the services back over to those who are charged with carrying them out further. And I want you to always remember as I close out my portion that God loves you and we at the Church of Christ at Northside do as well. Until the next time we meet again, take care and God bless.
Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all. But this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for thy son's sacrifice upon the cross. Father, we ask as we take these emblems, which represent your son's broken body and shed blood, that we may do so with clean hands and a pure heart. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it all. Amen. Let us remember in the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And here at the Church of Christ at Northside, we have several options in which you may give your offering, such as bank pay, cash app, and PayPal. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the many blessings that Thou has bestowed upon us. Father, as we use these gifts pleasing and acceptable to Thee, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Still have joy. I still have your yeah, I Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. 
grace of God and the sweet communion rule, rest, and abide with us hence more now and forever. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This ends our worship service online broadcast for today. We thank you for tuning in. And again, we hope that you were blessed in some way by joining us. We invite you each and every Sunday at 1030 a.m. as well as our other weekday Bible study and prayer broadcast that are scheduled during this time. We continue to pray for your health and safety. We are located at 18460 Conant Avenue in the city of Detroit. Be blessed.